Are you serious? So, this is How To Kill An Hour. My name is Marcus Bronzy. There's plenty of ways to kill time out there. Uh, we've actually been killing time trying to get our current guest onto today's show. I just want to welcome um, Oli Ollerton. Um, you may know him from SAS Who Dares Wins, uh, also a motivational speaker and an author as well. And on today's show, I'm, I'm glad to have you on to talk about your brand new book and everything around that. Thanks for coming on the show, Oli, man. No, it's a pleasure, mate. It's a pleasure. I'm uh, very passionate about the book, so... Uh... I just I, I, I don't apologise, but I must warn you, I do get lost in myself. So, because uh, I'm extremely passionate, so that's all right. Perfect place for it. Long form content on podcasts. Get me? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, but just before we get into the book, Ollie, how have you been killing time during lockdown? I'll tell you what. It's just uh, I haven't got enough time. Uh, you know, it's it's like a lot of people. I don't know. It's, it's, it's I. I've always had issues when I've had time on my hands. And for me, um, you know, I think, I think it's because I am quite creative. Anyway, um, when I sit there with nothing to do, it, it drives me insane and too much goes on in here. Um, we, you know, I, 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 sometimes, you know, I talk about this in the book, but we can overthink a lot of stuff. And um, a lot, you know, we are wired negatively. So you've got to be careful about what's going on in there. But the more I can occupy myself with stuff, I mean, I still have the structure to the day, uh, which is something I talk about um, in great detail in the book and, and you know, in all my podcasts that I do. Um, I tell you what I say to people, people say, what was it like leaving the military? And it's really hard to sort of say, oh, you know, you say it's tough. And I don't think there's any better example than now when people, you know, that the, their, their scaffold in the framework to their every day, their week has fallen away. And now that they've ended up with a seven day weekend, which sounds like bliss when you, when you work in nine to five, but now that we're here, um, you know, the, the sort of scaffolding framework has fallen away to your day. Like I say, you haven't got the, your network, your support network around you and you can start to feel very isolated. We're in isolation. You feel isolated. And that's what it's like leaving. You know, that's what it's like when you, and you've got nothing, you, you know, and, and there's a massive void there. You know, as, as humans, we need purpose. We need something to, to drive us forward. And when we haven't got purpose, too much goes on in here. And, um, and, and before you know it, you're, you're in a flat spin of despair. So for me, it's, it's been, you know, I'm doing a lot of these sessions. You know, this, this book, I would have been out there touring around the whole of the UK, signing, meeting people, doing, uh, you know, going to festivals and stuff like that. And, you know, I'm, those other authors out there will understand at the moment that, you know, it's a very different way. Well, it's a very different way in general of doing business, isn't it? But, you know, you've got, you've, we've got to try and use every opportunity to get the book out there. There's no better time <clears throat> than now for this book. Um, you know, my, we probably could have made more money if we'd have waited, but for me, my drive is not the money. Um, I can, I, no, let's, let me talk about that now, actually, because I'll say let, we'll talk about that later and we'll forget. My drive used to be money. You know, when I left the military and I think, I think, um, I learned a lot from this for years and years because you don't get paid much in the military. So a big lack in my life was money. But so that became my focal point money, money, money. And it was always about the money. You know, the money was first, you become a slave to the money. It wasn't until recently until I came up with, you know, my company Breakpoint and stuff. And then the show kicked off that my drive went away from the money and it was the passion for what I did. And once I changed that relationship, everything changed. I no longer, you know, I no longer was money's bitch. And it really, the whole, my whole uh, relationship with money, I now use that as a tool. I use it to experience, you know, it's a tool for my business. And once you change that relationship, your whole, uh, everything around you, your business, your lifestyle, your, your, your mental sort of focus changes. Um, and, um, you know, I, le I learned that, um, you know, that, that really for me is about understanding purpose, it's, which, which is a great sort of um, underlying theme of this book. We need to understand what our purpose is. Um, so anyway, I know I'm not giving you much chance to talk. <laughs> Listen, I'm but, fine with that, Oli. I'm doing lots. I'm doing lots. I built, I built a media studio in my house. I'm still finishing off. Um, I've ripped out the bathroom. So 
between sort of podcast interviews, I'm running up the stairs, putting a few tiles on the wall, Class. putting a few coats of paint on, and then I'm doing interviews and all that. Kind of, I'm, I'm busy. I'm busy as. Well, they are saying that sales are up at uh, stores like Homebase and Wix and stuff. People are getting quite active. There, there's a lot of people that are getting those odd jobs done. And I, you know what? Why not? Why not? Why not use your extra time to do things like that, improve your house around you, and also um, improve yourself mentally? And le- I mean, let's just get straight into it. I mean, I w- I w- you mentioned routine, and we will talk about that because that's a, that's a lovely part of the book that you discussed. But um, what's interesting about this book is that when I first opened it, in both uh, physically to read and also uh, listen to it as well, which is quite interesting. Done the audio book as well. Great timing on that as well. Um, the first thing that struck is that you share a lot about yourself. You really open up in this book. Um, you start with a childhood experience, you know, when you were, I believe, 10 years old. Something that happened yeah. to you. How was, how was that kind of sharing that experience? Because that was, that was a big thing for you to share with your audience. Yeah, well, first thing for me is... Um, one thing I'll never do is I'll, I, I, I've done it in the past, but I won't fake perfection. You know what I mean? I'm not, you know, and Instagram's terrible for that. People will like faking perfection about how perfect their life is. For me, they're the only for people to absorb this book and the content from it, and for it to be of a real um, help to people out there, it needs to come from someone they can relate to. Now, if I'm stood there on a pedestal saying I was, I'm cut from a different cloth on this, that, and the other, everyone's just going to say, well, he's, he's obviously a different type of person. I'm not that type. So it's, it's, it's so important for me just to be totally honest about, you know, the, the book isn't about, the book has got a lot in there that, you know, is, will make people think, Jesus, he, he's been through the ringer. And I'm quite, I've got, I need to put that across to people. You know, I've had some major highs, major highs being like passing special forces selection at 24 years old, top of my game, and then absolutely going sub-zero below, you know, into a state of depression. And it was really about that contradiction of two different people. And I was looking back going, what happened to me? And, you know, the one thing I'll say about special forces, I don't hang on to that. You know, it's something I did and I'm something I'm very proud of. And it, you know, it, it helped it paved the way of the person I am today. But, you know, my focus is, is, is forward. My work is, not, as far as I'm concerned, I haven't even started yet, you know, and, and that's the way I look at things. Yeah, I look back there and I, I'm, I'm proud of what I've done, but I'm not hanging back there going, remember that, remember that. You know, if you, if you focus on what you did, you can never only really achieve what you had. You know, there's going to be nothing greater. And it's all, you know, success in life for me is about continually, and that's on a daily basis, and that's why the book's called Battle Ready. Every day I'm fighting a battle to be a better version of myself. Every yeah. day. So, so really, you know, it's, it's about um, being totally honest, showing people that even though you're in, the, you know, and the, the book is relative to everyone, because at some point, you know, at one point I was at my absolute bottom. And I, it's really important that when people go through a state of trauma, whatever that is, it doesn't need to be military. And this, you know, for me, um, my biggest battle, you know, there was World War One, World War Two, and then there was World War Me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, yeah. that, and that, was, that was after leaving the military. You know, the Special Forces never created me and defined me. You know, it, was, it prepared me for the battle ahead, which I had no idea was coming to me. Um, and I think as well, when I look at it, it's the first time I've really looked at it this way, I've become, because I achieved such greatness, I became complacent. And before I knew it, that allowed me to, you know, I was, I was abusing alcohol, I was abu- abusing Valium, taking steroids at one point. And it's easy to get into that destructive kind of lifestyle, thinking you're invincible, when all the way along, you were only invincible to the outside world. And that's all you're focused on painting. The outside picture of creating a picture of perfection, you know. And what I'm, this is a reflection for me because I, I, I sort of really start to concentrate and focus on this. We are so focused on creating a persona of someone we want everyone else to see that we become the byproduct. You know what I mean? The byproduct exactly, is yeah. the real you, and that byproduct is the one that's got the depression. It's the one that has a day when they're sat in the corner, maybe crying in tears. You know. But we're so invested in making sure from the outside world, this mannequin looks great. 
it looks great. And that really, you know, I do believe that everyone has that. It's just, it's just the way we're wired. But the thing is, you can't allow that to, you can't allow yourself to be the byproduct of that. You know, that should be a byproduct of you. You know, you should never take away that, you know, you are number one. I mean, one thing else, another thing I'll say is, I know long, and, and this is why I'm so honest in the book. I'm no longer, I have to, and like I said, I have done before, I don't do anything so that people think I'm, I, I look great or what. I'm just me. I'm, you know, I am as I am. I'm not doing anything because I'm trying to paint a picture. I am just me. And I think once you get away from that, really what helps with that is once you become away from the self criticism and all that kind of stuff, you know, we are very, very um, self critical. And, and once, and that's all ego based. Once you start to understand how we all work and start to get in touch with your ego and understand what's going in, going on there. Um, I always talk about, you know, a mechanic can never fix a motorbike, he can never fix a car until he knows it, how it works. Once he knows how it works, he can do a fault diagnosis. He knows what needs repairing. And once that's happened, he can get that machine running to the best of its ability. You know, this book for me is, is, is exactly that system for the mind, body, and soul. Um, but, you know, we're born into this skin at an early age, and we're all like jumping, and we're like, whoa, I'm off. I'm an expert. You know, and, and we're not. You know, there's, there's, we don't come with a manual. We don't, you know, and we, we're just fly, all flying all over the place thinking we're experts. Uh, and one thing that seems to come last out of everything is this muscle up here. You know, and really focusing on any kind of mindfulness practices, uh, that kind of thing, because that is so important. You know, one thing I talk about in that book, and that's when it all changed for me is, you know, I was bouncing out, I was bouncing around all over the world, and I was, I was, I was not happy, I was not fulfilled, I wasn't fulfilled in the special forces, I wasn't fulfilled in the military, uh, you know, and I was, I was out there trying to find this external thing that was going to make me happy. But the problem was, I was trying to, I was, I was, I was, I was chasing an image of happiness yeah, and not chasing the feeling of happiness. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's what we all do. The perfect car, the perfect house, the job, the girl, whatever it is, we all chase these things and it's based on an image, not on a feeling, you know? Yeah. And for me, the only way you can find that feeling is when you stop looking out there and start looking within. And you know, that sounds a bit far out there to a lot of people, but you know, I'm, so, I am heavily invested nowadays in, in what goes on in here. And, you know, part of my morning routine is meditation. A lot of people get freaked out about meditation, especially because I'm from the Special Forces, blah, blah, blah. Meditation for me is my focused attention at an intention. So all the things that I want to do, all the things that I'm invested in, all the things that I enjoy, I focus on them in, you know, 20, 30 minutes in the morning. And for me, we have 70,000 to 100,000 thoughts going around our head a day. Some people a lot less. <laughs> me <laughs> <laughs> some people are a lot less but the thing is you can it just it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that unless you choose some things that you want to align with you're going to end up with a load of stuff that you don't yeah so for me you know uh, the book again is about striving towards a goal everyone needs to have a chosen goal and when i say chosen goal there you know everyone knows that you know, you go to a corporate seminar or something like this. And I know a lot of people have been, I certainly have. And there'll be someone say, right, who here's got goals? And there'll probably be like two people that, yeah, I've got them. They're in my wallet now. And, mm. But the thing is what people don't understand is regardless of whether you've got a chosen goal or not, you've got a goal. Our subconscious is focused on our dominant thoughts. So it will, it will, it will direct you and steer you towards your dominant thoughts. So regardless of whether you think you've got a goal or not, you've got a goal. You know, so you've got to really make sure that the things you think about, what's going on in here, are something that you want. Because the more you think about something you hate, the more you'll be steering towards it subconsciously and you don't even realize you're doing it. Yeah, definitely. And, and in the book, to, to, to focus your breathing and, and using meditation to help cl get some clarity is very interesting. And, and one thing that you mentioned a number of times, and it was, it was a good reminder to hear about how important it is to understand how 
by using meditation, just by using a simple breathing technique, you can help to reduce cortisol. And, and that's something you talk about quite a lot. And it was a really nice reminder, you know, if you're feeling frustrated and stressful in certain situations by taking some time to just think about your breathing and what's actually going on in your mind when you are feeling a certain way, really helps to kind of redirect you and help you negotiate out of that. Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, I mean breathing is such a, such a, it's, you know, at the end of the day, when you talk about this stuff, unless you understand it, everyone goes, oh, that's hocus pocus yeah. crap. It doesn't, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a load of airy fairy. It's not. It's, it's, it's just how, when you look at how we work, when you get into a stress situation, they're actually teaching this method in special forces now in some countries. I, doubt, I don't think they do it in the, in the special forces, in the UK. But certainly, um, you know, it's, when you get into a stress situation, let's, for instance, because everyone can relate to it, when you fall in cold water, the first thing that happens is your breathing just goes absolutely mental. And that's what takes you into a state of shock. And what ha what's happening there, because you're not getting enough breath into, or oxygen in, your cortisol is increasing. And that's where, in that moment when cortisol is increasing, you lose clarity. You become very confused. Our brains can only handle five to nine pieces of information at any one time. When we become extremely stressed, we can only handle one to two. And what will happen in that moment, you will try and you will not take or make the correct move to try and remedy, remedy that situation. You will just go the quickest shortcut to think I can get out of this situation and you'll end up walking into further danger. Now, to give you a second, a moment of clarity, all you've got to do in that situation, and they teach this in the RNLI, teach it when you fall into water, is just control your breathing. First thing, control your breathing because that lowers cortisol. And it allows you to make decisions from a mindset of clarity and not confusion. It's exactly the same thing in special forces teams stacking up on a door. You imagine the pressure there, the immense pressure of not knowing you've, you've, you've stealthily got up to this door, whether that's on a ship, on a building, wherever it is. And then you're about to go in that door. You're undetected to that point. And then you're all stacked up against the door, four man teams stacked up against the door. You imagine the anxiety. You know, if you don't have control over that breathing and the breathing pattern, cortisol is going to increase. You're going to get flustered. You're going to make the wrong decisions. So really, it's about in those moments, if you know, if you know you're going into a stressful situation, start to really control your breathing and have a systemized breathing pattern. They, they call it box breathing. Quick, go through that. It's four breaths in, four breaths out, hold. It can be three seconds. It can do whatever. And you know, so if you know if you know you're going to a stress situation, just make sure you get that breathing pattern going. That's going to keep your cortisol down. That's going to allow you to make that decision based on clarity. Okay, and then base it. Or if you suddenly find yourself like like the, the the water situation, freezing cold water, the first thing to do is just take a, a massive deep breath straight away. First thing, you know. And people, how does that relate? I'll tell you now. It relates to a load of things, negotiations in sales, everything, arguing with your girlfriend before you react. <laughs> Where were you last night? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's an explanation. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this, it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just, I think, uh, you know, having the ability to take a moment of pause when everything around you is telling you you must do something is the key to success, a successful outcome. And me and Foxy really sort of came across that. We were talking, how do you get into these like horrendous situations when a million things are going on that you can't control? How do we manage to slow it all down? And we just thought about, you know, we, when it gets into, the only way, way you can do it is by not allowing you to become panicked, stressed, and for your breathing to become extremely erratic. If you do that, then that situation becomes very confusing. You will take the wrong action. Exactly. I mean, and I've found personally for myself, I, I practice meditation of some sorts, like with my breathing when I'm not in a stressful situation. So that if there is a time when I need to get into it, I've practiced getting into that mindset as well. So not just waiting until I am riled up, uh, but also yeah. in the morning, just before I have my coffee, because the coffee usually gets my heart going a little bit. Just before I have my morning coffee, I'll... um. I'll spend five, five minutes, 10 minutes just working on a little bit of breathing. Um, sometimes I'll just do it myself. Sometimes I use a little app on my watch, but just, you know, I, I find that that really helps. So reading that again in the book was a really interesting thing to kind of come across. And another area that you open up about as well as substance misuse as well and, and kind of 
um, how how one can fall down a hole there, and also you you again delve into science and you share quite a lot about your your healthy uh, eating routines as well, which is is quite nice to hear too. Yeah, no, the thing is that there's a lot of science based evidence in that book because I, I needed people to understand that you know I I'm not I'm not making this stuff up. You know, I've I've read stuff to give me the knowledge. You know, and then a lot of stuff I've sort of created it's come from theories of my you know which which seem to line up correctly but you know it's, it's important for me to 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 mention the people that have influenced me inspired me to think the way that i think because i know i don't think like every person you know and i don't think, i don't think like the majority i know that um but um you know I, I, when it comes to nutrition and stuff like that i mean I, i've got in there about this crazy cocktail i have it like first thing when i get up and i've seen some people doing you know and people are oh, it's disgusting <laughs> I never said it was going to taste good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yet to try it. I was like, turmeric in there. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's interesting. But um, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, the likes, of, the likes of turmeric, I mean, that, that reduces inflammation in the body. You know, all this stuff, you know, for me, when I get up in the morning, um, you know, you've been in a fasted state for probably eight hours, some less, you know, a bit less for some people. Um, your body's like a sponge. Now, the first thing I want to do is come downstairs and have a coffee. But it takes real discipline to go, no, don't have the coffee. Have, and he doesn't, you know, at the weekend, some, I'm not a strict disciplinarian that is so rigid in everything I do, you know, and that's why my book is called Bat Already. Every day, you know, I've, I've got my mind saying, have the coffee, go on. You, you did well yesterday. Rest on your laurels, have the coffee, da, da, da. Don't go for a run today. You did one yesterday. That was good. You know, so I'm fighting a battle every day. Um, and I talk about what's going on in here, why that happened. But, um, you know, it's so important for me to have that cleansing, you know, when your body's in that fasted state, what you take in your body in the first 30 minutes has such an effect on, 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 um, on your mental state. You know, and I, I, a lot of the stuff I talk about, I talk about mood food. People don't understand the more, if you're going to, you look at your, look at your body like a car. If you're going to put shit, can we swear on it? Oh yeah, crack on me. <laughs> if you're going to put shit fuel into a car, it's going to run like shit. It's the same as, you know, I, I see, you know, people put better fuel in the cars than they do their bodies. And they don't understand the gut, the connection between the gut and your mind is, is so linked. So if you're shoving processed food in there, you know, microwave meals and all that constantly, the thoughts up here are going to reflect the crap in here. Um, so it's really, you know, that, that, uh, you know I've, got, I've got an app out with Foxy called the Battle Ready 360. And the reason why it's called the 360 is because it's mind, body, and nutrition. Unless you're taking care in some respect of all three of them. If you're just, if you're just eating crap food and you're just going to the gym every day, you look great. It doesn't mean you feel great. A lot of people that are, you know, these muscle-bound people are on Instagram. It's, it, that's out of insecurity. Yeah. And, you know, that's why I'm, so that's, that relates straight back to what I talked about before. They're so invested in making sure I look great from the outside in. You know, I'll, I'll compromise everything, my mental state, everything, to make sure I am faking perfection and everyone thinks I'm great. I did it for years. You know what I mean? So, and, and I, again, you know, the book is totally honest about, I was there, I mean, at one time I was out in Australia, I was working out three times a day. Jesus. I, honestly, I was so ripped. I looked like a, I looked like a load of peanuts in a, stuffed into a condom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, and that, that, that's, that was my focus I was like oh I was getting so much attention and it was like oh, oh this is great and I, but behind my closed door I wasn't happy I wasn't a happy person but I didn't care as long as everyone thought I looked great and I was getting the attention and blah 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 and, and until I adjusted that and realised that we shouldn't be chasing an image chase a feeling that's where happiness lies and like I say nowadays look if I don't do anything to impress anyone else. I just am me and like it or lump it. Yeah, definitely. And um, it's really nice to hear somebody, because obviously as, as somebody who's ex-Special Forces, you're seen as like the most masculine, manly, man of man. So when you're having these conversations, uh, it's really helping to improve that kind of conversation between men as well. Because as we know, men uh, in general are still not very good at talking about how they feel are you aware of how important 
you having this conversation is on, on encouraging others to kind of open up and discuss these things. Yeah, 100%. You know, this whole old, it's, it's, it, you know, it is the stigma and everything about this alpha male thing is just so, um, it's holding so many people back. Um, you know, they're, they're so invested in the person they think they're supposed to be. It all keeps coming back to the same thing. You know, stop the bullshit. Just stop the bullshit. And, you know, no one's, the only expectations, the only critic that's out there is, is you. You know, you, you're living up to your these own self-created um, images of this person you're supposed to be. And it's, it's not just let that bullshit fall away because... Real men don't just stand there going, you know, look at me, I'm so hard and all this and, you know, I'm so tough and I'm not, I'm scared to talk about my emotions. You know, people need to talk about their emotions. They need to let the barriers down and start talking about that isn't being, that isn't weakness. Being weakness for me is, is someone that is hiding behind a shield and a persona who, who, and a persona of who they think everyone else is expecting them to be. So really for me, it's about, you know, I come from that world. It doesn't, you know, that's, I adapted to be a special forces soldier. You know what I mean? And now I'm not a special, I've spent longer outside the military than I, than I was in it. So yeah. I've had, you know, I've had a lot more experience beyond the special forces anyway. So that was just a stepping stone for me. And it certainly didn't set me in stone of this alpha male. And I, I see it, you know, on my Instagram, I see it, you know, people are like, I put some posts on there and it could be of a spiritual nature. It could and there's some people you can see are absolutely devastated. You know, some people that read, like my first book, Breakpoint, some people that read my books are like, oh, I wanted war, I wanted death, I wanted that, and it wasn't there, you know. And I'm like, you know, people's expectations or people's perception of who I am are so totally different. And uh, that's just because I'm not trying to be someone for anyone else but myself. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, and that, and that does come across in the book. And as I said a number of times, you, you, you do share some personal experiences and, and, and you do, you know, you, you do share some operational things, but that's, that's not the point of the book. I feel like you're trying to give us examples of, of where you've made mistakes and, and where things have worked for you. And, and it's, thank you for sharing that, man. I, I really appreciate that. I mean, uh, you also discuss uh, a very big change or shift shift in thinking where you made a journey physically and also um mentally where you went and tried uh, I'm sorry off the top of my mind i can't remember the name of the substance that the, the drink that you um had over a few days and they increased the uh strength of it um it was a spiritual experience wasn't it ayahuasca uh that was it that's the stuff yeah <laughs> yeah May that was that was the most phenomenal experience in my life, and um, something I have still um, I'm going to be heavily invested in the future with as well. Yeah, ayahuasca, you know, it's it's an ancient, centuries old plant medicine. Yeah, um, that really, um, you know, ayahuasca is is really helps you. Um, for me, it was about going back to um, my childhood trauma, which now I realise. I mean, you you scraped upon it before, but for people. For people that know know me, they'll know that at 10 years old, I nearly got ripped to bits by a circus chimp, um, nearly killed me. And, um, you know, I thought, you know, childhood trauma is probably one of the worst because you are such a, a sponge at that age. Um, but, um, you know, when that intimate trauma happened, the emotional intimate trauma and what we do, what, we, what we're wired to do is lock it away. And, yeah. and try and try and ignore it, forget about it. And for me to think that that could happen was was quite stupid. Now, listen, I'm 49 years old now, and looking back, it's easy to do. Like hindsight, but hindsight never won any wars. However, it's good to reflect. Yeah. Um, and and I saw how influential that attack from 10 years old. It changed. I haven't got any memories really that I can really bring to mind of anything pre 10 years old because the trauma was so horrific. Mm. Um, but that changed me and that put me on a, a self-destructive course of absolute mayhem. I managed to, to gain some gems from it, you know, like joining the special forces, joining the Marines, but it really did put me on a path of destruction and, 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 and this level of craziness. I had no, 
um, no consequence. Um, I was void of emotion, um, and I was just ch chasing danger. And and that's why the special forces was was perfect for me. The military was perfect for me. You know, I wanted to I wanted to be in war zones day in day out, and I wanted to be you know, it, it's not a healthy relationship at all. It's certainly one that's changed nowadays. So really, for me, it was seeing how how that had affected my life and still up until that point i went away to the retreat in costa rica you know i was still carrying that with me you know although i've managed to change my life stop drinking got my life on track i felt like that destructive mechanism was still there only in little you know and i felt that possibly if something happened it wouldn't be too far when i pressed the red button and went and self-destruct again so i wanted to rid myself of that and i wanted to to deal with with the trauma now, one thing about ayahuasca, you take the plant medicine, it's, it is a hallucinogenic and it takes you back um, on a journey, on a, a, an amazing journey within yourself. Now, you don't get to go where you want. It goes to where it's needed. Yeah. You know? So you can go in there saying, I want to go back to this day when it doesn't work like that. It goes to where the medicine is needed. I went over there with, with 10 other veterans from all over the world uh, to a place called, amazing place called Soltara in Costa Rica, took the plant medicine, and lo and behold, I went back to being the, you know, to the little boy, 10 years old. Yeah. And uh, it was amazing. And, you know, I actually went, it was an out-of-body out of experience, if you want to call it that, into the body of me of a 10-year-old. And it really helped me um, with so many observations and so many thoughts about that attack. You know, I've always gone on to everyone, you know, I talk about it, and I've talked about it in my books, I've talked about it at corporate talks and all this and it's always been about me 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 it's always about me and i'm the victim and i'm the victim and then it was almost like in that moment when i was um you know um on this journey that someone sort of i heard an echo and it said what about the chimp <laughs> and it was the first time i'd actually thought about the chimp and cut a long story short i'll talk about it in a book but yeah, that yeah. I, I actually went into the chimp then which was phenomenal but what it helped me do is it took me out of being a victim. You know, stop me being a victim. I didn't become a part of that story. I became the whole story. It allowed me to, to, to have so much compassion. I walked into the flipping monkeys um, arena that day. It didn't come yeah. looking for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I, I never appreciated that. And all it was doing that day was protecting its young that I was stood over. Um, and it, but, you know, it just helped me have so much compassion for that chimp. You know, I've been on this sort of circus, bouncing around the country in the heat, on a chain. You know what I mean? And it just took me out of being the victim. And it allowed me to become the whole situation. It taught me compassion. And then I sort of reflected on, on this journey as well. We had four or five sessions of ayahuasca. And it really helped me put that into perspective about everything in my life. You know, at one point as well, I was sat, you know, and it was horrendous at the time. But I was under the chimp being attacked. And I was fighting with the shimmy, it was horrible, you know, I was dying. And then all of a sudden, another, then this voice echoed again. It was like, what would have happened if you had not fought that day? Yeah. And I, I, I stopped fighting in, in, in this journey and I was laid down. And all of a sudden, I closed my eyes. My girlfriend was laying next to me in my vision. And I looked into her eyes and I just stroked her cheek and I just said, look, everything's going to be okay, come with me. And I closed my eyes and I died. Jesus. That, as bizarre as that sounds and I'm, then I, became, I went into the spirit world the afterlife whatever you call it and it, it was phenomenal absolutely phenomenal I was no longer a body it was, I was a spirit and it was it was amazing but then when I came out of that it was like it made me reflect on that situation you know if I'd have stopped fighting that day and then it was a reflection about my life ever since that attack I've been fighting everything the system my schooling my parents um Everything around me has been the fight. My relationships, my work, the whole lot. And it was like, stop fighting. Just stop fighting. And yeah. it was such a, such a massive reflection for me. That, you know, one thing for a soldier as well to be taught. Uh, one thing about ayahuasca and plant medicine is, is the key word really is surrender. You have to surrender to it. You have to surrender to yourself to allow it to, to really take effect. And teaching me, who was attacked by a chimp and, and, you know, didn't allow that chimp to kill me at 10 years old, and then joining the special forces, the word surrender is really pretty alien. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
so so for me to succumb to that and allow it you know it's amazing once you surrender to yourself you know the good work really starts to happen in all walks of your life so for me you know like ayahuasca i went with another veteran all the all the veteran stories were amazing and they're looking at you know they're looking to introduce um plant medicine for for ptsd yeah. which you know people there saying those sessions were like two years of therapy it was just just amazing i went there with an organization called the heroic hearts project which is an american organization that are focusing on using plant medicine for, for guys with ptsd yep. with amazing amazing effects um and we have now started a um uk branch of that so it's heroic hearts project uk so pretty pretty soon um we're just going through all the uh you know building of the websites and stuff like that but pretty soon we'll be uh, opening up uh, the ability for guys with PTSD to, uh, and girls to, to basically um, venture overseas um, and um, go to a, an ayahuasca or plant medicine retreat. Um, and really, you know, it's, I would say with that kind of treatment, it's not for everyone, but, you know, you have to be really open. And like I said before, you have to know that you've, uh, you've, you've got to learn the word surrender. Um, yeah. And I think uh, until you actually do learn the word surrender anyway, you know, we're talking before about people that are these alpha male, you know, you know, the facts of the matter, they can't surrender. You know what I mean? They can't surrender to their ego and people that can't sur surrender to their ego become a slave of their ego. Um, so really, you know, it's, it's learning that, you know, like I say, it's not for everyone. You've got to be open to accept that kind of treatment. But really, for me, if there's something out there that is helping veterans and people in general, I want to promote it, you know, because I do believe, you know, that, you know, a lot of these ancient men medicines have been lost along the way, you know, with the big pharmaceutical companies and stuff. You know, people are quite happy. You know, as soon as you go to a doctor these days, it's just a case of sliding a load of pills across the table. And I've lost friends through, you know, ex-military lads who have gone to the doctors with depression for instance and then they're on the antidepressants that says on the packet you know has a um has a side effect of causing depression i mean i just can't work it out so anyway i digress but the whole point is that you know it's about providing different options for people yeah and certainly you know if i was suffering with ptsd and I, i've had my issues uh which i've addressed big thing for me and i, I say this time and time again there's a lot of people out there that are claiming you know they've got mental health issues but then they they're hitting the drink they're hitting the drugs and you might have mental health issues but you're never going to get to the root and the cause of it unless you take that stuff away i'm not saying don't drink people don't drink i'm not an advocate against drinking i'm an advocate against if you've got issues then you need to cut away these external facts and that's even your food that's why i talk about it in this book that's why your food everything is so important what we put in here is so important i mean my water, for instance, we're, we're 65, 75% 70, of water, but people are quite happy just not even caring what, what kind of quality of water is going into the bodies. I distill all my water. So I know, it, again, I, I do extreme. People will look at that book and some of the practices I put in play sound extreme, but I'm invested in myself. And I'm invested in myself to create a longer and happier lifestyle, life and lifestyle. I mean, if that's not a selling point to anyone, I don't know what is. You know, someone said to me, when I first said, I've had loads of comments, and I said, look, if you don't want to drink, that's up to you. And if you, for me, it doesn't, it doesn't produce anything productive. Um, but someone said to me, you only live once. And I'm like that. Exactly. You only live once. So, you know, I want to make sure that the older I get, you know, the more invested you have to be in your health because, you know, our bodies start to deteriorate. Our mental health starts to deteriorate. You know, by the time you're by the time you're thirty, neuron your neurons start to die, but that doesn't stop the amount of information that's going in, and that's why I think when you sort of get to your thirties, into your third, wherever it is, you don't have to have been in the military. You have to have some focus on releasing what's going on up here. You have to have some focus on some kind of mindfulness um, practice. I mean, like yourself, you said there, you know, about just in the morning before you do your coffee, it doesn't have to be some long-winded sitting yeah. on a hill with chimes and you know it doesn't have to be that <laughs> trying to levitate just... yeah <laughs> exactly you know what i've not over the weekend i've not meditated for three days now and i sat there this morning i'm like my head's starting to chatter and i can you know yep this and i'm like i know exactly why that is 
because I had three days where I've not bothered to meditate. And meditate for me, you know, you imagine meditation for me is, is, is going through the practice of clearing all the chatter. So you've got some space. Now you can imagine how throughout your working day, your every day, the ability to do that is absolutely gold. When everything's going on around you, by the end of the day, there's so much, you know, the ability just to clear all that, breathe, breathe through it, is, is just, is gold, is golden. 100%. The, you know what? The problem is half the time in this book is that this is not magic. The magic is within you. The thing is, the simple processes are in there, but the, just because it's simple doesn't make it easy. Especially when motivation, self-discipline and motivation is... Well, I talk about motivation, right? Because motivation is a misconception that people think they're cursed because they're not motivated. People say, oh, I, you know, day before they're like that, right, tomorrow I'm making a start. Um, tomorrow I'm going to go out running and this is going to be the new me. Yeah. Six o'clock, the alarm goes off. Oh, I just couldn't do it. Of course you couldn't do it. Because you allowed that to tell you you couldn't do it. And that, yeah. for me, you know, is about, in those moments, just understand that, just before you go to bed, understand that when I get up tomorrow morning, my mind is going to tell me not to do it. But hey, guess what? I'm prepared for you. I'm prepared for you. And when that happens, you just go, no, no, no. You just block it off. And yeah. that's when you follow process. If exactly. I follow, you know, I get up in the morning, you know, at five o'clock in the morning. I don't want to get up. And I don't want to go downstairs. There's so many other things that my mind's trying to be devious. And go and check your email. Go and check this. Procrastination, hesitation. Before you know it, oh, I couldn't do it. I didn't have time. And then yeah. once you, once people say that to themselves, I didn't have time. It's almost like a, it flatlines everything. It takes you off the guilt hook. It takes you off everything. Oh, it's because I didn't have time. You haven't allowed the time. That's, that's the problem. So really for me, it's about, you know, and the book deals a great deal with process, process, process. Switch off the program and follow your heart. Mm. And that's what it's all about. Because exactly. the more you listen to the program, the more you get, it's going to talk you out of doing everything that, you know, if you want to make changes, your mind's going to tell you not to do it. That's, that's fact. It's yeah. not going to fluff around. It's going to be really devious. It's going to distract you. It's going to take you away from actually taking action. And that's when you need to take action. I know in the morning that if I just disengage from that, go through some positive affirmations, whatever it is, and then I know if I put my trainers on, go out the door, as soon as I've taken one step, everything's changed. And that's so important. I mean, that, that's a really key part. And again, you cover this in the book as well. Like Your routine now is a uh, mixture of a number of steps and yeah you, people might be listening now think jesus cocktail in the morning exercise da, da, da. but one thing that helped me is is i started off by doing one thing so you know and you in the book you talk about progressing just you know from walking to running for example but all you have to do is is start you know if you want to get out and, and stuff I, I always say this to people like with a diet because I, I for a while i was really big really skinny really big, really skinny. And, I, and when I was trying to kind of find my rhythm and, and find out what worked for me, I found that to be consistent for me, it just started off by trying to be consistent with one small thing. Can I get the right amount of water in my body today? So it might not be distilled water yet, Ollie, all right? But could I get the right amount of water in my body that day? And then could I eat all of the right things first before I start taking out all of the wrong things? And if you have enough, once you get all of the right things in there, it's quite easy to take out the wrong things or easy us, should I say. So that was a really nice bit of the book that resonated as well. The fact that you spoke about process and, and cause a lot of the stuff that you say, if you do think about it all at one go, all in one go, changing your whole life, that's quite intimidating, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just too much. It's like, yeah. you know, we, and that's, that's what happens. I mean, we, we want, you know, there's so many people that go, right, that, that's it. It's all big changes. They're like, They'll go and they'll buy all the equipment and then they'll be like that. And then there's so many bits of equipment like shoved under beds in lofts, all that kind of stuff. You know, like you've just hit the nail on the head there. My girlfriend got up this morning. She wants to make some changes. You know, I'm always pushing it to follow my similar kind of routine. She got up this morning at five o'clock and she was like, I got up this morning at five o'clock and I didn't do anything. And then she kind of sniggered. And I said, I said, babe, you got up at five o'clock. I said, that, 
that's the first day. you get up at five o'clock your body gets into a routine of getting up at five o'clock once it's got into that routine you can you've then got the bandwidth and the space to then take on loads of stuff but if yeah. you like wait oh, i've got to change i've got to do this I've got to do it. before you know it it all becomes far too much you know one thing we talk about in the special forces is one meter square okay when all around you is falling apart when everything seems so overwhelming Bring it down to one meter square. Just focus on you and your immediate environment and keep on moving forward. You know, that it's great to have goals, you know, you, and I'm a firm believer, I talk about that in the book. You have a goal, okay, that scares the shit out of you. It must scare the shit out of you. Um, but the thing is, that goal can be broken down to very bite sized chunks. The, the, the goal, the ultimate goal, you know, and I say in the book at the start, you know, Nothing was ever great unless at some point you doubted your ability to achieve it. So valid. But the thing is, I know that I can break that goal down into bite-sized chunks. If I'm like, for instance, next year I'm going to run the, you know, this is for example, because I'm not going to run the London Marathon next year, but if someone's never ran before and they're like, next year I'm going to run the London Marathon, that might, and they've never done that before, they're not a runner at all, they'll think, in that moment, they'll, afterwards they'll think, no, nah, that's stupid. But if I know that next week I've got to, all I've got to do is walk one kilometer. And I've got to keep consistent and follow process. And before I know it, the second month, I've then got to, 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 to run a kilometer a week. You just build and build and build. And, that, you know, even if you're 25% towards your goal, it's better than 0% and nothing. Exactly, exactly. Even if the, even if the goals um, or even if the targets or the goalposts change sometimes, like with that MMA fight that uh, you had as well, which is um, something that I've heard you talking about and also is in the book too. That was, that was very interesting, no? Because that was a situation where you were battle ready and, and things changed outside of your one meter square and, and you still kind of showed how you progressed through that. Yeah, no, that was, that was and you know what, I was, I was, at one point, I was angry about that because it was it was quite dangerous. It was an amateur fight, and then right, I found so. out the guy the guy was a you know was a, a professional MMA fighter. So, uh, but the thing is, you know, I could have pulled out of that fight. But you know, for me, and that's what I typify as battle ready. I didn't. It, it was you know what when I was stood nose to nose with him in the ring, he wasn't there. You know, as far as I was concerned, it's, I, I'd achieved everything I wanted to achieve. I got knocked out in one minute 30. I gave it a good blast. <laughs> but the, the fact of the matter is I learned so much from that. And it's not about the, you know, for me, and this is the big thing, that whole process was about what I learned on the way to the ring. You know, it was having something that hooked me into making sure I was disciplined, I was training every day. And by the time I stepped in there, and even when I stepped out or crawled out, <laughs> um, you know, I was, I was, I was a different person, and it was I'd, I'd achieve what I wanted to achieve. It wasn't the outcome that I'd have preferred, but you know, you and the fact of the matter is as well, you don't allow things like that. You learn from everything. Exactly. You know, success is a series of failures. You know, mm -hmm. it's never, it's never a straight line. You know, it's like a pinball machine. You know, your your goals are like a pinball machine. You go. You want to go. You want the ball to go straight up the middle, but before you know it, you're being bouncing left to right, and then all over the place. Yeah. And then before you know it, you're straight between the the, the flippers, and you've got to start all over again. Yeah. But it shapes you to go the way that you need to go, and your goal might change. But mm. the thing is, it's all about keeping momentum, having some kind of goal that keeps you with a sense of purpose, a sense of um, understanding for what why you're here. You know, I think it's so important and. You know, when you look at the whole evolution of us, we're not, we weren't just put on the planet just to, just to like eat, sleep, and, and all work. The rest. <laughs> all the rest. I was going to say something else. <laughs> you know, we were put on the planet to, to, to evolve, to experience, to create. Um, and, you know, if you're not doing that, there's no wonder you sat there. You're going to, you know, you sat there thinking that my life is uneventful. It's, you know, you're going you're gonna to be depressed if you've got nothing. You know, if people are stuck in a job that they hate, you need to, you know, and I, I don't expect everyone to like, oh, I'm, I'm, forget that job now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start painting yeah. pictures for a living. You know, it doesn't work like that. But, you know, if, if you're, you have something mundane that you don't feel purpose in, find something outside of work that creates a purpose for you. It can be something quite simple. Join a club, do something. Because you need something more than just a just a, a method of process to pay the bills. You know, life isn't about just getting up every Monday because you've got to pay the mortgage, you've got to pay the finance. You need to have more purpose than that. 
And if you can't find it through your work, you need to find it somewhere else. Don't just sit there and be dormant. You know, water stagnates when it's still. Yeah, totally agree with you. Totally agree with you there. And one thing that we can see uh, or an experience that we can see where you, where you quite physically put people through their paces, uh, it'd be hard not to talk about, is obviously SAS Who Dares wins. We get to see a very physical side of that, you know, you getting people to expand what they think they can do mentally and physically as well. Um, most recently, there was uh, the celebrity version as well this year. Mate of mine, Yasmin Evans, was on it. Um, you know, she... She battled for it as best she could. Um, and she just, she spoke about it as an experience that really helped her, that you, you and the guys have really helped her to kind of expand what she thought was possible physically and mentally within herself as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad we are talking about the show because it's just finished last night, you know, yeah. it's, and it's been epic. It really has been amazing. And I think, you know, the show, I, t- I say this all the time. It's, for me, it's not about the military. It's about human psychology and it addresses, it inspires so many people because we get those people on the show and yeah. if people are left to their own devices, you know, they come with the will to want to succeed and they're the people that last, you know, that they, they are prepared to be pushed around a little, shouted at and pushed into that constant discomfort and anxiety. And that is really when you can only start to grow. When you're pushed outside your comfort zone, you can't or don't have the ability to design the perfect outcome that suits your ego. You, you're just in a world of quite vulnerable. You're vulnerable. And then when you, that's, that, and that's why people get so emotional on the show. I tell you now, it's because it's the first time I go back again to, to what I said before. And this is amplified more by the celebrities. They've created this person they want everyone else to see. They come on that show, that person is, is not around. They haven't got the ability to design those outcomes. They are, for the, for the first time in a, such a long time, even probably longer than they can remember, they are, they are having, they're seeing themselves for who they truly are. And that's why they get so emotional because their, their thoughts, their feelings, their reactions, everything they do is organic, it's raw, it's the real them. And that's why, you know, people, I've, I've spoken to celebs. I think they, I like the celeb version because people understand and can see the process in play. I know that person, like Tony Bellew, I know, everyone knows him from the outside world. Then you see him on that show, you saw the change. Everyone saw the change. Yeah. But the thing is, when, when it's the non-celebrity version, you don't know, the other, you don't know what the people were like, so you, you don't fully understand the value. Mm. But... Mm. That's just using, using Tony as an example, like Joey Essex. Everyone, you know, they come on that show and before they, it's, it has an everlasting effect. And that's what happens. That's what we do with our company, Breakpoint. We don't do the, the physical kind of um, stuff, but, you know, we tap into people's minds. We put them into a state of discomfort. And that is where you really start to, once you start, once you see yourself for who you are, you get to know your strengths, your weaknesses, and not a voice in your head that's telling, telling you what your strengths and weaknesses are. You know what, people, I, people ask why people put themselves in to do these kind of events and, and really push themselves. And I, I think, for me, it's because they're sick of hearing their ego lie to them. They're sick of this person lying about who they really are. And our egos are responsible for that. You know, we're trying to, again, I, I, I'm always coming back, you know, Stop being the person that you think everyone else wants you to be and just be you. Yeah. Easier said than done. Oh, 100%. 100%. But I, I, unless you buy that. Unless you buy that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, for the podcast listeners, Ollie's got the book up. He's, uh, he's holding out for us. <laughs> but um, do you know what's, what's interesting about, about that show is that Dev also, you know, is a big part of How to Kill an Arrow as well. He went through um, a very intense grilling when you had him on a one-on-one session. And, and I think that's when he decided to tap out of the show. Yasmin said she had a very physically challenging time as well. Both of those people, when I said, would you do it again? Without hesitation, said yes. They'd do it again and again and again. And I was like, was it some of the most challenging times of your life? They said, yeah, it was physically and mentally challenging. But the things you learn about yourself uh, are invaluable uh, yeah. in, 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 that, in that kind of uh situation and, and we're not saying i know ollie's not saying that we have to go out and do that to ourselves to learn about ourselves but it's always really interesting i mean i've whenever i watch um whenever i watch it i always think i'm in two minds i'm like would i would i re- i think i'd like to do it and then sometimes i'm like fucking hell that looks really hard though. <laughs> but um it's it's yeah it's a very interesting watch indeed so yeah um 
Yeah, I'll tell you, the problem the problem is that we are wired to only want to do the things we know there's exactly, going to be a yeah, successful yeah, outcome. Yeah, we're wired yeah. that way, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and that's why it comes down to goals and everything because we were a lot, so many people choose a goal that they know there's a good chance they'll achieve. Yeah. Because they, they, then they're not going to, you know, the threat of feeling humiliated, the threat of feeling like a failure. But once you let go of all that self-criticism of thinking there's a thousand person audience following you around everywhere, laughing at you, then once you've got to let go of that, you know, this, this is all a construct for the ego. You need to yeah. really, you know, look into, you know, there's so many resources out. I'm not just, this isn't just the pitch to buy my book. You can go on Google, you can go anywhere, you can find out all this information. You know, it's, it's just about investing in yourself. Definitely. So, uh, you know, the more, the more you do that, um, and, and the really, you know, the bottom line is, going back to what you just said there, the way we're wired is to, is to chase short-term comfort. But the thing is, chasing short-term comfort leads to long-term pain. Now, and that can be alcohol, that can be sort of food, it can be relationships, whatever it is. But the, 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 the sooner you start to embrace chase, chasing short-term comfort, that leads to long-term gain. Everything, any, 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 any growth, any change in your life that's positively linked towards achieving something, um, you have to go through a period of, of, of discomfort to get there. It's great. So that's, why, that's why our first book, and that's why my company is called Breakpoint, because it's that sliding moments window where you can either go back to your comfort zone or you can push through that short term. It's a very small window of discomfort. You know, if anyone, rem everyone, every, everyone will remember Katie Price being on the show. She handed in her armband because it got a bit tough. Ten minutes later, she was in there going, I can't believe I've just done that. You know, and that, that's the problem. That, that typifies what most people do. You know, at that point of, of absolute pressure, they throw in the towel. You know, five minutes after she'd done that, it all ended. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and that's, that, but that, that's, you know, that's not, no disrespect to Katie Price. That's just the way we are wired. You, you know, it's, it's, it's a band-aid, isn't it, to the situation? But it leads to long-term pain because she, she'd have really benefited from that whole experience. Definitely, definitely. And on, on the, t on, on the uh, topic of long-term, what are your kind of long-term goals for Breakpoint and what you want to provide? Yeah, well, really, I just, you know, we've, it's take, we've been going five years now and we've really shaped into something um, that is we're really proud of. So we have got a veterans academy now. So we take veterans on a three day course. Um, and we, um, then we're working with an amazing company called the Ryan rail who then we're putting the lads into jobs with the lights and network rail. Great. So that's an amazing project for us. We want to have a few centers around the UK, you know, putting, putting veterans back on the map. So that's a big focus for us with Breakpoint. corporate training side of Breakpoint. Um, that's the big focus for us. You know, we want to push further overseas, which is which is already happening. Uh, and then me and Foxy have got our battle ready band brand. So we've got the the fitness app and everything. Everything we do is, you know, our mission um, is to create uh, a globally or globally identified brands recognised for the positive growth and development of others. Yeah, and I feel like well, you're well on your way up. I, I just want to, I'd, I'd love to check in with you in the future and see how you're getting on with things. Cause um, it's just, it's a really refreshing point of view that you have on self-development and uh, you know, the book is doing really, really well. Um, I believe it's number one in its genre on, on Amazon. Um, and what's great is you've actually got the audio book out as well. Like I mentioned, which is really interesting because we really get to, you know, I've, I read a bit of it and I listened to a bit of it because you can do that with, with all, quick ad for audible. You, know? uh, you can <laughs> listen to it and, um, and, and read it with whisper sync, but hearing you, describe some of these situations really helps me to take it in in a different way because it's you telling your own story so thanks for making sure you did that and and at this time i guess at moment in time when people have a lot to do you know around the house or and stuff they can always pop the audiobook in as well and have a listen while they're doing bits and bobs i think it's a really valuable listen um perhaps even reading it and listening to it as well would be quite cool yeah well you've got i mean I do agree. I mean, the time we can spend, you know, a lot of the time I used to listen to crazy music, you know, all the time. <laughs> I still do from time to time. But the thing is, yeah. you know, when you're in the car or when you're doing something, um, you know, it, it pays now and then just to, just to, you know, invest in yourself and listen to a good podcast. Yeah. Um, but the thing, you know, with the book as well, it's like, it's, it's, 
I warn you, it's a call to action. It's a war cry of procrastination and hesitation. Yeah. You know, so, you know, there's exercises in the book that I actually do, which is the same ones that I did um, in 2015. So I really, um, you know, it's about taking action. Uh, it's, and that's why the book is so relative to everyone, because it's, it relates to them. It's, it asks them questions about their lifestyle, asks them to make notes, you know. And it, it goes to exercises at the end of nearly every chapter, which um, will, will help to define um, or, or, or make a more productive um, version of yourself. And happy. Most definitely. Most definitely. Most definitely. And, and thank you very much for spending the time to have a chat with us, Ollie, man. I wish you all the best. Also, just notice you've got the same microphone as me in the background. Is that little Rode Pod mic you got there? What's, what's the setup you got? People are always interested to hear what kit they've got. So that's a Pod mic. What's that plugged into? Mate, this was actually plugged into this laptop. But the thing is, I'd love to, te- mate, I'd love to show you uh, the, the media lounge out the back. Ah. Oh. Mate, I've, this, is, this is actually stolen from out of there. So I've got two of these. I've got all the road, Roadcaster equipment. Nice, um, nice. I've, actually, I've got, I've got um, Pioneer um, decks out there, everything. So. Oh, nice. When yeah, it's all ready, let us have a look. I mean, our audience loves to see stuff like that. So when, yeah, when no, you're ready, give mate, us a I've shout. Just, I've just made this amazing floating table. Oh. That it all sits on, mate. It's, I've, I've got to send right. you a picture. Oh, please do. Yeah, yeah, send you a I picture or a video. Yeah, oh god, send us a send us a video, man. I want to see the tour of it. Yeah. I want to show us around. Oh, I love that I'm sort of it, stuff, mate. man. Yeah, mate, you'll, right, you'll love it. You'll love it. Oh, cheers to that, Ollie. All right, mate. Well, um, thank you very right, much for giving some time. To oh, great talking to you as well. Uh, and Battle Ready, uh, it's out now. Make sure you get it on on, on all platforms. You can get it as a book. You can get it as an audio book as well. Um, there's plenty of ways to kill some time out there. I've been Marcus Bronzy, joined by Ollie Ollerton. Thank you for killing some time with us. Just before we let you go, though, on all of our social medias, it's at How to Kill an Hour. I'm at Marcus Bronzy, M A R C U S B R O N Z Y. And do you want to share your social medias as well, Ollie? Yeah, pretty much if you use ollie.ollerton. But you can also go to my website as well, which is ollieollerton.co.uk or .com, where you can see all my projects, buy my books or whatever, and just see what's going on. Wicked. Thank you very much. Cheers for killing some time with us, mate. Thanks, Marcus. Take care, man.